how do you study self-compassion? So you measure people and then what, what are you looking at and, and what did you learn? Originally, ma- people mainly studied self-compassion by using the self-compassion scale, but um, we started developing other methods. So there's nothing wrong with self-compassion with, with scales. They can be very useful, but it's hard to know. Um, if you do a correlation, it's hard to know like, do people who score higher on the self-compassion scale score lower in depression because they're higher in self-compassion or is it that they're low in depression? Yeah, and that's, yeah. you don't know the directionality. Yeah. So other ways we do it is we uh, do what's called a mood induction. For instance, you might have someone think about something that's troubling you right now, maybe, you know, a relationship challenge or something difficult in your life and write a paragraph with mindfulness kind of recognizing and validating that it's hard for you right now. So turning toward it with mindfulness, write a paragraph reminding yourself of common humanity that, you know, it's only human, you aren't alone, it's part of life. And then write some words of kindness to yourself the way you might write to a friend. So we give them that mood induction and compare that to another group where we just don't say anything, Mm. which means they're probably just beating themselves up and we can see how that changes. Mm. And the other way we're doing it is we actually train people to be more self-compassionate through some of the training programs that have been developed. You know, what happens when you actually practice this daily in your life? And so they all converge, luckily. All the data really points to the same place, which is that self-compassion is very good for you. So it reduces negative states of mind. We, We know this causally, not just through correlation. You know, it actually does reduce depression it reduces anxiety. It reduces feelings of stress. Um, you know, things like eating disorders. Some people use food or alcohol as way, a ways to cope with their pain. And so if you're more self-compassionate, you have another resources to, to cope with your pain. So you don't have to use these more, you know, unhealthy or unhelpful behaviors to help you cope with your pain. But the interesting thing, this did surprise me, is that it's also linked to like happiness and life satisfaction. And the reason it surprised me is like, if you look at my scale, it's all about suffering. You know, how do you relate to yourself when you've made a mistake or you failed or you're going through a stressful time? And so even though self-compassion is by definition aimed at suffering and challenge and difficulty, it feels good when we're kind to ourselves. It feels good when we remember that we aren't alone, we're part of a larger whole. You know, it feels good when we're present as opposed to just fighting things all the time. And so because compassion itself is actually a positive state of mind, even though it's, you know, holding the pain of our, of our life, uh, it actually generates positive emotions that leads to things like hope and optimism and creativity. So that's that's part of the reason it's so powerful. It's like um, transforms our suffering into something really meaningful, which is compassion. 